You know, Pastor Bill last week talked about why did Jesus have to die? He laid the groundwork to understand what was at stake and how that relates to us. And that now takes us to the point of looking at the action. Would it be fair to say that Jesus suffered in his life? Maybe not every minute, but most certainly a lot of the time. And in the last days, he suffered significantly. Would we also agree that Jesus is a servant? Unquestioning, unquestioning. You know, in, in looking at Jesus in his life and considering him the suffering servant, in the Old Testament, it says in Isaiah 53, Jesus quoted it when he said, it is written. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. Jesus, although he was without sin, was to be counted among sinners. And then from there, we're going to go look at Isaiah 53. But notice at that point, he was numbered with the transgressors. Now, that's not talking about he was number 1,497 of the transgressors. It's talking more like, see those people over there? See that group that's huddled in that circle? Those are all transgressors, and that's where he is. It was pointing at the fact that that was not only a label, but it was a viewpoint of who Jesus was and is to them. We can go on and read what's talked about in Isaiah 53. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God. Think of that word stricken. Smitten by him and afflicted. Now, I was afflicted for a couple of weeks a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there was a few days where I was miserable enough I would have been happy to crawl under a rock and go to sleep. It was just terrible. I felt the affliction of having that flu. Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. What an interesting way of stating our peace and our resolution in life was on him. We can think of that like uh, that burden is on his shoulders. He was crushed for our iniquities and punished. The punishment that brought us peace, his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. The Lord has said, or excuse me, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, when we think of Jesus being crushed for our iniquities, anybody got a thought on what that means, what that meant? Uh, you know, it's not like we put him in the garbage compactor and crushed him up all nice and small. That's not what it's talking about. You know, in the time of this season where Jesus was going to eventually be taken and put on the cross and crucified, crushed, we can relate that to overwhelming, overbearing mental burden. Have you ever seen someone crushed in spirit, mentally? They come to a point where they can't function. And, you know, just so you guys are at speed, after the loss of Larry, Donna has done very well in Tacoma. But last week, 
she hit the wall. She hit the grief. She hit the sorrow. She hit the depression so deep. And it was God who brought her through it. For a moment, her spirit was crushed. But not for long. When we think of Jesus and what he has done for us, when we think of him being stricken, smitten, afflicted, those all imply actions. But if I were to tell you, what does it mean? What is being esteemed? What does it mean to hold Jesus in high esteem? What would that mean to you? Esteem, holding Jesus in high esteem. What does that mean? What is that all about? Dave? Okay, we would reverence him with awe. That is a very good description of that. You know, I'm going to tell you straight up front at the beginning of the message here. The esteem that is written in Isaiah isn't about that. It's not about holding Jesus in awe. We're going to look at what that meant. You know, in Isaiah 53 and verse 3, it talks about he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow. Despised means to scorn or to view as a vile person. There were those people who looked at Jesus as a vile person because of who he was, what he represented, the supposed lies he told, and the people he hung with. And being rejected of men, you know, Rejection can come in many forms. It can come in, go away, I don't want you right now to bother me. It can come in, I'm sorry, I want a divorce. It can come in the form of, son, I'm really busy. I have to finish writing this paper. Can you come back in an hour? Turned away is softer, but rejected. Cut off. And a man of sorrows, sorrows, what are sorrow? You know, sorrow, we can think of that and very easily realize it has to do with grief and pain. But going beyond that, what does that mean for us in this season of Easter, recognizing this time in which Christ died for the burden the weight of our sin. What does it mean? He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. What kind of grief are we talking about here? We're talking about Jesus being acquainted with anxiety, calamity, sick, feeling that knot in your gut that comes when you know something significant, maybe bad, is going to happen. And in that, Isaiah 53, verse 3 goes on to say, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. If you want to know what that looks like, When we hid our faces the way it's talked about here in Isaiah, it is this. Now, what did you see? What did that say? Could it be? Wow. Look at how serious and important that is. Sure it could. Could it be? Oh, my God, you've got to be there and take care of this, Father. Could it be, 
the old saying, holy cow. It implies an emotional response of astonishment. And the fact that we hid our faces from him. He was despised. To scorn, to look at as a vile person. To disdain Jesus. And to let other people know you disdained him. You see, in Isaiah 53 here, we're talking about how the world viewed Jesus. And as Christians, do we come near viewing him with those descriptive words, with those descriptive actions? Isaiah 53 and verse 3 goes on to finish its thought with this. And we esteemed him not. We didn't esteem him. As Dave said, hold him in high regard and have reverence for him. Now, to look at that word esteem, that's going to carry the thought for the rest of the time we talk here. The esteem I told you there is not of holding someone in high regard. It is different. It is a primitive root word that goes back a long time in the language of the day. And it's pronounced playite or play it, P L A I T. And its distincted, distinctive meaning is to interpenetrate interpenetrate that is a literal thought that means to weave or fabricate to have an intentional plan and to contrive something on purpose and here's the corker it takes thinking it takes having regard for something to find value in something, and to compute it. To compute it. To ha have esteemed him, we would have been interpenetrating. We should be now interpenetrating with Jesus, with him through us, to weave and create a fabric of what? Faith. Jesus and his death is about salvation of mankind, but it's also about building our faith. Notice I didn't say creating it, but building our faith by inner penetrating with Jesus and he with us in a manner to weave and fabricate even more than there was a minute ago, an hour ago, and to create that fabric of life we call faith. Now, we know that Jesus went on to bear our griefs. In verse 4 it says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, Yet we did esteem him, and this esteem here is talking about something that's the same as I mentioned the first time. It is to interpenetrate and to literally weave and fabricate something. It says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God, and afflicted. What is that talking about? Obviously, it's a viewpoint that we have looking at things. But to be stricken of God? What does that mean? What's that all about, that he was stricken of God? It literally means to lay hands upon for the purpose of reaching someone 
and acquiring a specific result violently if needed. To strike, to beat, to bring down. So here we are, described here in this verse, when we saw Jesus and thought he was stricken and smitten of God. What does smitten mean? It means, again, striking, to beat, to cast forth, to give wounds. And if you go and look at the, we'll call it the vernacular of the day, it implies the wounds are open. They're fresh. Means to go forward, to possibly kill, to murder, to punish, to slaughter when you're stricken. That's a broad meaning, meaning, excuse me, I mean smith. And if we're to look at the rest of this verse and understand its thought, we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Afflicted. What is it to be afflicted? Elizabeth was afflicted with a great deal of pain a number of days ago, enough so that an ambulance had to come get her. She was afflicted and tormented by the pain. I actually watched her writhing in pain, waiting for the ambulance to get here. And then they kept her a few days and sent her back missing one part. And she remembers being afflicted, but she's no longer afflicted by that pain. Her appendix went south a long ways. And I was worried watching her. And I thought of that, that affliction, afflicted. What did God mean by that? What did God want us to take away from that phrase? We did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. And it comes down to this meaning of looking down at or browbeating. Anybody remember grandma or grandpa browbeating you as a little kid after you stole four too many cookies? That happened to me a lot. It means to depress. Literally, it also means to chasten and to deal hard with something, to exercise for it. But it can also mean ending in tenderness. So to be afflicted, you might suffer greatly, but turn around in a time a little later and you receive benefit from it. Isaiah 53 and verse 5 talks about, he was wounded for our transgressions and was bruised. And what does it mean to be bruised? Well, it means to crumble. It can also mean to literally break in pieces, to crush, to destroy, to make humble, to oppress, or to hit. And the just of this, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and his stripes, by those stripes we were healed. That bruised is intentional. It has a distinctive result. Bruised implies a mark that identifies something. If Dave pokes me in my left eye with his fist and does it right, I will have a bruise and everybody will say, I didn't think he hit you that hard. If you go outside and you trip and fall and hit your knee in the ground, you might have a bruise on your knee. Now think of this. 
Jesus was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. He was bruised for our iniquities. That's suggesting our iniquities in this process he went through to save us left marks and evidence that people could see. It left things people remembered. By his stripes we are healed. Stripes are very interesting. You know what a cat of nine tails is. It's a whip with nine little leatherettes at the end, and on the end of those leatherettes might be metal, might be bronze, might be uh, iron. It could be something else, but it was designed to really make a mark and leave that mark permanently. Uh, a whip will leave one of those marks. But when we talk about our peace was upon him and with his stripes, we are healed. That is bringing to our attention the blueness of his flesh where the damage was done. Bringing into focus his hurt in the view of his It is something we're supposed to be aware of and be able to acknowledge. And, you know, to be healed, Elizabeth was healed. I was healed, and my blue Eileen was healed of hers. Others of us have been healed. But is that the kind of healing we're talking about that Jesus brought to us through this? Realistically, if we get down to the brass tacks, it means to mend as in stitching, to cure or cause to heal, to repair, or to make whole and thorough again. Do you notice anything about those words that are unique? They're all actions that require interaction to give that benefit to us. It means somebody is at work doing those things. Verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, people who've been around farms and around sheep know sometimes they can be pretty dumb. You take one sheep, get him excited, and send him off that way, and pretty soon about uh, three or four out of every five are jumping in the air and following this one sheep going, who, who knows where? And they have a habit of getting in trouble. You know, in the biblical days, the sheep were out, the lions were in the mountains, and the sheep would go to graze right in front of the lion. Today, in our days where people raise sheep, they put pens and fences up to keep the Mountain lions out. They don't let them go astray. Remember why a shepherd had his staff with a crook on the end. It was to catch the sheep that had gone astray. And here we're told, like sheep, we've gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way. And the Lord is laid on. Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Have you noticed how the world is becoming more and more self-focused on their own way? Well, I'm sorry. I don't care that mankind means the human race to you. It's a derogatory term. So I'm grading your paper with an E because you use the word mankind. By the way, that happened in a university this week in the U.S. And it made it on 
Al Jazeera News, and it made it on Fox News Network, but it never made it on any other shows, any other news station. The professor graded the girl down, basically failed her because the professor subscribes to an ideology of language, strips away the character of people and the benefit that the word gives society for understanding. Like sheep, we've gone astray and we've turned every one of us to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of all of us. What does it mean to go our own way? You know, we can think of a road. We're going down that road. We're going that way. But when we get into it, it's talking more about moving away from something because of something. And it also is hinting at the idea of a journey going towards something else. So when we go astray, we move away from one thing and we move intentionally towards something else. Have you ever heard of situational ethics? People make a choice and justify it because that's what they believed in at the moment. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. What does it mean to oppress someone? It can mean to tax them, to harass them, to tyrannize them, to bring distress, to drive them to an action with exact intent. He was oppressed. He was essentially driven to the cross by the actions of others, by the needs of his own people. He was afflicted, yet he opened his mouth not. Here's Jesus, and he's dying for us, and he doesn't open his mouth to say anything, but yet in the silence is the greatest defense of mankind ever, ever. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. As that sheep is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Now, what does silence do in a situation like this? When you were little, did you do something wrong and you were going to get whooped for it? Did you go and put the encyclopedia in your pants and buckle your pants up? and then think you were going to be funny and it wasn't going to hurt? Or did you go ahead and take your licking and keep on ticking? Uh, you know, as a kid, I remember my brother and I and all my cousins constantly trying to explain away the flooded basement, the broken window in the car across the street, dark coming and being six miles out of town at a rock court. We were always as kids trying to explain away what we did. And we didn't have the sense God gave a rock to shut up and learn. We spent more time talking and missed the lesson. And Jesus went to this task that was put upon him by, the, by God the Father and he didn't open his mouth to complain. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who all shall declare. Let me read that again. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people, he was stricken. Now, stricken in this term 
means a blow. It also gets really personal. And it talks about it in the sense of a plague, in the sense of a sore, a sore wound, a wound that might not be healing so well. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit. Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is Jesus didn't say, you wait, I will have my revenge. That's not what happened. That's not what he thought. That's not what he did. He had done no violence. Now, you remember when he went into the temple and turned the tables over and booted everybody out? What were the two things he was dealing with? Bringing that place back to a house of prayer as the Father had intended it to be and to remove the fraud and to remove the lying and the cheating that was going on through the priesthood. Violence, by very implication, wrong action. Violence means unjust gain. It can be performed by an oppressor, an unrighteous person. Violent, leading to clear wrong. Clear wrong towards other men. Yet it pleased Lord, the Lord to bruise him. Again, we come down to that point where it talks about to break into pieces. Do you think Jesus was feeling the mental weight of anguish and of stress and anxiety while this process is occurring? You bet he was. That's why he came fully God and fully man. It was to walk in our shoes and understand it. He understood everything as he had his role, but experiencing it as we do is a whole nother issue. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief when you, you excuse me, when you shall make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Now, here's the crucifixion, here's Jesus, here's all these things being talked about, and get the picture. It pleased the Lord to bruise Jesus. He had put him to grief. He was suffering mentally and emotionally. When you shall make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. We can think of that and realize that Jesus was looking towards the future, not the past. What is this seed of salvation going to provide for mankind? He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. The pleasure of the Lord prosper in his hand. Boy, that is intentional good coming out of something that's being pointed at here. What is the pleasure of God? To save mankind? To have relationship with humans? To be praised and worshipped and to adore his children and be able to lavish them with life everlasting? To save, to heal, 
This is about that act of bringing what God wanted to take place through Jesus to mankind. He shall see the travail of his soul, and he shall be satisfied. What is travail? Trouble or difficulty? It can even be toil. Toil is, seems to me, when I toiled in the garden against my will, I had a hoe and a pitchfork in my hand and a rake nearby, and it was hard work. It's hard work to toil. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Look at what is being said. And who shall be satisfied? He shall see of the travail of Jesus, of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. What, what do you get from that idea of knowledge? By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify me. Eileen? The light of life be satisfied. Well, that kind of sounds like death has been extinguished or pushed, pushed out of the way. In verse 12. Therefore will I divide him a portion of the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death. In short, I'm not coming to do the best I can do. I'm not coming to do my best. I'm not coming to give my best. I'm coming to pour out everything. Everything. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This description here in verse 12 is a thought that is a it's a word picture about the plan having arrived at a certain place. Therefore I, excuse me, therefore will I divide him a portion of the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Now, what is spoil? You remember back in the day here that we're talking about when God said, go take the land and kill every person in it, leave none alive, kill all the animals, burn the buildings, and that's yours, start over. Well, that doesn't sound like there was very many spoils. Now, if you change the context, pirates, when they found a ship in the ocean and they took it, the spoils were all the valuables they could take off that ship and take with them for their use. Spoil is the byproduct of possession in many cases. Therefore will I divide him a portion of the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressor, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressor. What spiritual action is this talking about? Justification and being set apart. Jesus justifies our life, our being here, our mistakes, our sins, our trespasses, Jesus justified all of that 
And it doesn't matter what it is. You know, some people go to the verse where it says, and a homosexual won't enter the kingdom of God. And then they turn right around and go to the verse that says, and Jesus died for the sin of all. In fact, it says, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Well, if you're forgiven, you're forgiven. If you're not, you're not. Why does this say the sin of many? Because not everyone chose to partake. We have the right to turn away and go our own way as sheep. And wander off if we choose. God does not desire that. But he does desire us to be saved, to be in relationship, to be living a fruitful, righteous life. As a friend of mine says all the time, to be found faithful as Christians. This story is really telling us that God wants us to be interwoven and intentionally creating a spiritual fabric as Christians. What's the fabric called? Faithfulness. Living faith. That is what this is about. Jesus and that cross is about us becoming interwoven with Christ, with the Trinity, in a relationship and choosing to participate for the blessings that will befall us, for the promise of forgiveness, for the blessing of salvation, what comes after justification, sanctification? What comes after sanctification? Where is justification and sanctification occurring? Here, now. When is glorification occurring? Later, later, beyond this life. You see, Jesus wanted us to understand clearly. And we go to the Old Testament to see the foretelling of Jesus and to see the foretelling of how this process works and to see an example of how to pick up our cross and follow him. To pick up our cross and follow him. You know, it's not by accident that we're all here today. Curtis chose to get in a bus. Randall's either playing hooky or has a day off. <laughs> Liz is here because she chooses to be. Jeff is for the same reason. Diane, as she so elegantly says, because it's my good and reasonable service. Nancy. It's our good, reasonable servant. You know what? It was Jesus and his good and reasonable service, the suffering servant, to bring us to where we are today. And to leave us, not at the foot of the cross, not at the opening of the tomb, but having marveled at the resurrection and the ascension, and that in his death is life. As the song said, I find, what was it? It said, life for freedom when my knees hit the ground. I got my life when I laid my life down. We live in total spiritual freedom. We need to be praying that it is maintained in America. We need to pray that we maintain it through the woven fabric of our faith that Christ wanted us to have. There is nothing we cannot ask for. 
There is nothing we will not receive if we ask in the name of the Son and we ask righteously. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day, for blessing us with the beautiful weather. I know we've gone on about that, but it's Washington. You understand. The sun is such a beautiful thing to see here in the contrast of the season. We thank you for bringing our friends to be with us, if not in person, but in spirit and in listening today. Guide us through the rest of this day as our weekend completes. Let this next week be set apart. Let the hands of Satan and the evil one be bound. And let the freedom of living in the spirit and living in the truth of Jesus Christ and his life and death, let that wash over us. Let us be filled to the point we spill out on the people around us. We thank you for this, and we ask you to bless us going forward. We offer our praise and thanks for your plan, for Jesus who filled that plan to the fullest, who came and poured himself out for it, and for the Holy Spirit who leads and guides. We are blessed by everything you put before us, and we seek to bless you with our thanksgiving, our voices, and the acknowledgement of your son Jesus and what he did for us. In his holy and righteous name, because his name is the only name that saves, we pray. Amen.